hello to everybody. I'm John Somerville. I'm Head of Financial Services here at the London Institute of Banking and Finance. A warm welcome to you all this afternoon. A chilly one in London today and I guess across the UK. Um, thank you for joining us. Our latest webinar on the proposed sustainability disclosure requirements and investment labels is what we're uh, is the subject we're covering today. Uh, so the FCA have issued their consultation paper, uh, and a lot of you will know it, CP2220, on their proposals for their sustainability disclosure requirements, or SDR, and investment labels. And you'll hear a lot about investment labels as we're going forward. Um, this proposal intends to advance the FCA's strategic objectives to make the markets function well, protect consumers and enhance market integrity, increase transparency on the sustainability profile of products and firms, and reduce the risk and harm arising from greenwashing. Um, this is a subject that's getting um, uh, more complex and um, we, we, uh, the FCA have got a real um, emphasis on making sure that it's um, clear and transparent going forward. And we're really looking forward to hearing from our first guest today, uh, who is Louise Chender, Senior Associate ESG Policy and Advisory, the Financial Conduct Authority, and full title there. Good afternoon, Louise. How are you this afternoon? Thanks, John. Um, very good, thank you, and very uh, pleased to be here. Absolute pleasure to be here to talk through our SDR and labels proposal. So, thank you for having me. No, it's an absolute pleasure, and uh, and for our, you know for our uh, for our audience today, you know somebody. Of your caliber has to be said, Louise, and I've, I'm going to, you know, having read your bio, um, quite a substantial amount of experience in this area. So um, just for everybody's benefit, Louisa is a senior associate at the FCA uh, for ESG policy and advisory, where she focuses on sustainability related disclosures and is currently leading on the sustainability disclosure requirements and investment labels having previously led on climate-related disclosure rules for asset managers and FCA-regulated asset owners. She also supports work with IOSCO, you'll have to explain that one to me in a second, Louise, I'm not sure what that is, on corporate reporting on sustainability. Prior to joining the FCA, she was the derivatives editor at Global Investor Group, which is a Europe, Euro money publication, and previously led a team of European language content editors at Thomson Reuters. Wow. Okay, so that's a, that, 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 that credential-wise, there's absolutely no doubt to begin with there, Louisa. Um, uh, so IOSCO is... Sorry, that's uh, IOSCO, um, the uh, International uh, Securities... Um, I'm not going to get the acronyms right. International Organisation uh, of Securities Commissions. Um, so essentially... Uh, brings together uh, a group, uh, brings together regulators uh, around the world um, to explore uh, policy uh, issues. And yeah, we're doing a lot of work with them on, on the corporate reporting side of things as the FCA co-leads the uh, corporate reporting work stream under their Sustainable Finance Task Force. Fantastic. Thanks for that, Louise. Well, what, a, what an explanation. So uh, we've definitely got the right person in seat. Uh, to, uh, on my screen, I've got video and, it's, and you're to the right of me. Well, on the left of me, um, is Lee Coates, OBE, Director of ESG Accord Limited. So, right, Lee, a warm welcome to you this afternoon. Um, and typically, as you are genuine, gen, and this is genuine, everybody, I'm in London today. Lee is literally my neighbour back in the, in the Forest of Dean. How, what's the weather like over there at the moment, Lee? Uh, cold. Cold, <laughs> cold and bleak. Oh dear. Well, so I've got that to look forward to when I get home. Oh, Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> um, so in 1989, Lee started a financial advice firm, Ethical Investors. This firm dealt exclusively in ethical and responsible in investment advice. In 98, Lee worked with colleagues from Ethical Investors to establish an independent ethical research company, Ethical Screening. And in 2010, he launched Australia's first animal-friendly superannuation fund, Cruelty Free Super. In 2011, he was awarded an OBE for services to ethical business and finance. And in October 2020, he co-launched ESG Accord, an advisor support business assisting firms to implement robust compliance procedures to meet sustainability preference requirements. Lee is currently part of the FCA's uh, DLAG, which is Disclosures and Labels Advisory Group, and undertakes consulting work for fund management companies and DFMs in, on ESG and sustainable finance related issues. So uh, I'd say between the two of you, I think we've got all bases covered when we're talking about sustainability. So I would say uh, the audience are going to be very, very well catered for this afternoon. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping for everybody. Uh, during today's webinar, we're going to look at the FCA's proposals 
proposed SDR and investment labels and their likely impact on financial advice and advisors. As we go through, if you have any questions, please add these to the discussion in the chat box and we will pick them in, uh, up in, uh, in our Q&A. We might not be able to get to all of them, but we will do our very, very best. We're aiming to get to Q&As at around about quarter to two uh, UK time. Uh, and then hopefully have uh, a, a decent amount of time ready for your um, uh, Q and A's. Uh, now, before Louisa gets on with her presentation, uh, first of all, we've got three polling questions for you today as well. And you'll be pleased to hear. And the first polling question, which Em are hopefully in the background there, working in the background furiously for us, uh, will bring up the first polling question for you. Um, but it's a fairly straightforward one. And how easy is it to compare different ESG funds? and match them to client objectives. So, um, yeah, right, okay. So we, I, I think we're gonna have some interesting results here. So um, nobody's coming up with fairly easy yet, which is um, not surprising. Um, so the runaway uh, leader in this is not easy, which I kind of think we, we would expect, but there's a good proportion here that find it very difficult or almost impossible, smaller proportion uh, are almost impossible, but certainly the vast majority at the moment, it looks like 70% of you, just generally speaking, find it not easy. There's a few coming in now that have, you know find it fairly easy. So good, uh, that's great news. It sounds like you're very, very well informed on this. Um, uh, but yeah, the vast majority there. Um, so if we can, uh, M, if we can end the poll and publish that, that'd be amazing so everybody can see. So yeah, as you can see there, yeah, not easy at 70%, very difficult at 22%. So those are the most popular answers with fairly easy and almost impossible at, uh, at either end. So uh, Lee, Louisa, I guess you, you, not, not too much of a surprise there. Thanks. Yeah, no, really, um, really interesting to see that kind of come to life. I think, yeah, hopefully what we intend to do with the uh, labels, it's, you know, we've framed it as helping the consumers to navigate the market, but hopefully that therefore follows on uh, for, for advisors as well. And hopefully that will uh, make it easier to, to differentiate between uh, the different ESG funds and then therefore match them to client objectives. But I'll, yeah, talk through the proposals very shortly. Uh, I'll see if Lee has any initial reactions first. Uh, no, just uh, reiterating what, what you've said. It's um, not a surprise, but the labels will make a massive amount of difference. That's Can't good to hear. It, 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 it's really all about making that not easy. You know, at the end of the day, there's always going to be a certain amount of client research that needs to be done here or research on behalf of the client. There's no doubt about that. This is always going to be a, um, a moving feast as well. But as you say, Lee and Louisa, labels really will make a difference. And I, I, so uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Lee, Louisa just now. So just as a reminder, if you have any questions, pop them in the chat box. You'll see that at the bottom of the screen. Um, currently, uh, I've mine says chat and a little red seven next to it. Um, so pop your any, any questions in there. We will get around to them as we go in, uh, at towards the end. So we won't be answering questions as we're going through, but if you pop them in the chat, we'll get around to those as soon as we can. So uh, I'm going to share the screen because I'm going to be driving the slides for Louisa's presentation. So I'm just going to bring that up now. And you'll also notice as I've shared the screen, you may find your videos uh, or video feeds from myself and Louisa and other people are starting to encroach on some of the slides. If you manage that by at the top of the box, there's a little, um, that there are little squares and you can, uh, I, I suggest you narrow it down so that you're just listening to either myself or Louisa, that would be amazing. So there you go. Um, without further ado, Louisa, I'll hand over to you and we'll move on with the first slide. Fantastic. Thank you very much, John. Um, and as I said, it's, it's a pleasure to be here talking to you all today about the SDR and labels proposals. Um, and yeah, as John said, Please do use the Q&A. We're really, uh, uh, sorry, the, the chat um, boxes. We're really keen to hear your thoughts and your feedback and um, yeah, keen to hear any practical challenges that you foresee as well. So please, uh, please do engage. Um, but yes, I will just give a uh, an overview of the key elements of the proposals um, uh, to kick off with. So um, if we could just move to the, the next slide, please. Um, I just wanted to start by putting the proposals into a little bit of context, but won't go into too much background. Um, I just wanted to clarify that with this consultation, we are playing our part in the delivery of the government 
government's uh, ambition for sustainability disclosure requirements across the UK economy. So that's uh, from corporates, asset managers and asset owners and building on the, the UK wide TCFD implementation. And the aim being is to create uh, the aim is to, to create an integrated framework for decision useful disclosures on sustainability across the economy. So in its roadmap uh, to sustainable investing that it published last year, the government signalled that uh, for the corporate reporting element, the standards developed by the International Sustainability Standards Board, or the ISSB, um, would form the backbone of that corporate reporting element. And then we at the FCA signalled our intention to consult on adapting our TCFD aligned disclosure rules for listed issuers to reference the ISSB standards once they're final and uh, made available for use in the UK. But the proposals in, in this uh, CP that we published in October focus on the requirements for asset managers. And we, we started here largely in light of the, the growing concerns around greenwashing and the need to protect consumers from misleading sustainability claims. So thank you. Yep, yeah, no, perfect to move on to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so uh, just to just to kind of reinforce that, I think you'll be aware the market for sustainability investing has grown rapidly. Um, in doing so, it has also become quite diverse and complex with terms like ESG, sustainable, green climate, um, all being used interchangeably, um, many different sustainability uh, approaches and strategies emerging. So with all that, there are growing concerns that some of those claims to be an ESG or sustainable may be exaggerated, uh, they may be misleading and they may uh, not be able to, to be substantiated in some cases. And essentially, consumers just don't know how to navigate the market. There's some survey evidence that, that backs that up. So, for example, our financial live survey found that 81% of the adults surveyed actually would like their money to do some good as well as provide a financial return. But at the same time, uh, consumers don't feel confident in how to invest and, and who to trust. And a recent boring money survey found just that um, it found that 86% of those uh, of consumers did not know uh, who to trust. So we need to address this um, and we are proposing to do so uh, in a number of ways. So just to give a very high level overview of the key elements of the proposals before I, I uh, give a bit more of a, a deep dive into some of them. First, we have labels um, that will help consumers navigate the, the complex landscape that I just mentioned there, and they'll be underpinned by robust criteria. Um, and they'll also be complemented by short, uh, simple consumer facing disclosures, setting out the key uh, key sustainability related features of products in an accessible way. Where a product doesn't use a label, we are proposing naming and marketing rules that would restrict the use of terms like ESG or sustainable. And together with the labels and disclosures, we really uh, intend for the, the, that package to, to tackle greenwashing and help to rebuild trust in the market. In addition, we are proposing more detailed disclosures at firstly at a product level on, on the sustainability features of products, but also at entity level on how firms are managing sustainability risks and opportunities in respect of the assets that they manage on, on behalf of clients and consumers. And the key aim here is to increase transparency and the, the flow of information along the investment chain. And just very lastly, we also considered the role of distributors, um, such as ourselves, in, in making sure that the labels and disclosures actually reach consumers. So we've proposed uh, we've proposed some rules that would require the information, uh, the labels and consumer facing disclosures in particular, to be made available to uh, to consumers. So just to uh, if we can move to the next slide, please, I will just give a, an overview of the labels and then disclosures. So as you'll be aware, we're proposing to introduce three different labels. And the aim here is to distinguish products based on firstly, intentionality. So the intention to achieve positive sustainability outcomes. And then also to distinguish products between on based on the 
investor contribution. So essentially the plausible channel by which the positive sustainability outcome could be achieved. So that may be through stewardship, through influencing asset prices or allocating capital to underserved markets to really achieve a positive real world impact. So if I just take each, uh, each label uh, at a time, we have sustainable focus for investing in assets that are already sustainable, such as renewable energy, uh, as a first example, uh, that would come to mind. And these products would be mostly invested in assets that already meet a credible standard for uh, environmental or social sustainability, or that are aligned with a specific theme. And we are proposing a threshold of 70% 70, uh, 70 of assets invested in that way. We also have a label called sustainable improvers. And this, this is for investing in assets that might not be considered sustainable now, but have the potential to improve their sustainability over time, including in response to uh, firm stewardship influence. Now, just to say a couple of words here. So we feel that this is an incredibly important category in terms of being able to support the transition to a more sustainable future. We very much recognise that many assets are on a journey to becoming more sustainable and actually firms can play a really important role in accelerating and encourage those encouraging those improvements. But obviously, at the same time, it needs to be clear to consumers that that is actually what the, the product is, is seeking to do. So um, if I move on to the next category, uh, we have sustainable impact and this is is for investing in solutions, uh, solutions to problems, uh, often in underserved markets or, or to address market failures to really achieve a positive real world and measurable impact. And key elements of this uh, category are clearly stating a theory of change and then having a robust method for measuring uh, impact. Now, of course, there are other sustainability related investment approaches. Um, uh, ESG integration, for example, exclusions, and we're not saying that these aren't important, but these alone wouldn't qualify for a label as at least alone, they're, they're not contributing to a positive sustainability outcome. So I think, uh, as I mentioned in the, the overview, if firms don't use a label, they will be, uh, they'll face restrictions around using terms like ESG, sustainable, et cetera, in the product names and marketing. Now, I just want to clarify that we'll be able to, to talk about those other approaches, um, but we're proposing that this be done in a proportionate way in, uh, in regulatory documents. Um, I'll also just uh, briefly mention the anti-greenwashing rule um, that again clarifies that, that sustainability claims must be proportionate to the, the profile of the, the product or, or service that the claims being made about. And we've taken the opportunity to reinforce our, our existing principle around clear, fair and, and not misleading uh, information. And just to, to clarify that this applies in respect of sustainability claims as well. Um, and in doing so applies to all regulated firms. So uh, essentially a much wider scope than, uh, than the labels uh, and proposals that uh, kind of the rest of the proposals that I'm talking about now. So if we move to the next slide, please. Great, thank you. So we have developed a set of criteria that firms will need to meet to be able to use a label. Um, we have designed the criteria to ensure that the labels are mutually exclusive. So essentially where products could potentially uh, contain assets that could potentially span over uh, more than one of the categories, the firm will need to decide which one uh, it wants to, to pursue um, and then uh, clearly set out a sustainability objective that it's seeking to achieve. And this sustainability objective is, is one of the overarching principles of the, the criteria. This will need to be written into the product's investment uh, objectives so that there's clear accountability for it. And then the rest of the criteria will flow on from the objective. So the, the firm will need to have an investment policy and strategy to actually pursue the objective. 
set KPIs to measure performance against the objective, ensure they have appropriate resources, governance, organizational arrangements to be able to deliver on the objective, and then maintain a, a stewardship strategy that's, that's consistent with the objective. Those are just the very high level principles that, that we're proposing, um, but I'm sure you have seen uh, in the consultation paper, we've also set out more detailed requirements sitting underneath those, uh, what we've called key considerations, and then more specific criteria for each of the, the categories of labels, and then also some implementing guidance to help firms uh, assess their products against the criteria. And we hope there that, that it becomes a structured framework for being able to assess products products uh, against. So if we could move to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, moving on to the disclosures. Um, as I mentioned in the overview, we are proposing a specific consumer facing layer of disclosure to really help uh, consumers understand the key sustainability related features of a product. And we carried out several rounds of consumer research to test various versions of this disclosure, which also includes the label on them, uh, to really help inform the proposals in the, the consultation paper. And what we found was that consumers were better able to understand sustainability information when it was in a standalone document rather than alongside information in a key uh, investor information document. So that's what we've gone ahead uh, and, and proposed a standalone document. And we're not proposing that this is uh, that this should be produced using the template. But what we are proposing are some parameters around the structure and content to ensure that there is some consistency in, in the way that the disclosures are being made, but without being too restrictive at this stage. So what will be in the disclosure? Uh, this will essentially include a brief summary of the product sustainability objective, the investment approach and performance against the objective. Um, and uh, of course, the, the label or if there are if there's no label or uh, there was uh, the firm isn't following any particular sustainability approach, they'll still need to produce the disclosure that essentially those fields will will either be uh, a bit more limited or not applicable, uh, etc. Um, we also feel it's important that, uh, that the, the consumer facing disclosure links to other sustainability, uh, sorry, other non sustainability related information such as costs and, and charges to ensure that consumers aren't just uh, focusing on sustainability information in isolation and that it also links to uh, more detailed information, which I will come on to in just a second. But just wanted to clarify that although we're framing this consumer facing disclosure as a consumer disclosure, um, it's also very much designed to be helpful for, for advisors as well and accessible for advisors um, uh, at the same time. So if we can move to the next slide, please. So, as I mentioned, the consumer facing disclosure will link to more detailed information if the consumer wants to know more. Um, but uh, we appreciate the more detailed information is probably more likely uh, going to be for an uh, institutional investor audience. So we're proposing disclosures uh, at requirements at two levels, as I mentioned, um, and we have sought to build from existing disclosure documents as far as possible to reduce the burden on the firms per producing those disclosures. So at product level, we are proposing that if a firm is using a label, that they would make uh, pre-contractual disclosures, so essentially uh, set out in a fund prospectus, uh, and that would set out the sustainability objective and the investment policy and strategy. And then separately, they'll also disclose the ongoing sustainability performance uh, of, of the, the product, um, essentially progress towards the objective. And that will be done in what we're calling a sustainability product report, which will build from the TCFD product report. Um, and then the same approach applies at entity level, we are proposing that firms build from the TCFD entity report and uh, cover rather than just climate uh, climate matters, uh, disclose their approach to managing sustainability risks and opportunities, but 
against the TCFD's four pillars, so governance, uh, strategy, risk management and metrics and targets. Um, and then we'll add uh, more specificity in time in line with uh, future ISSB uh, standards. If we could move to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, I will just cover just a couple of the changes that we made since we published a discussion paper last November. Um, we very much appreciate all of the feedback to that discussion paper and, and thank, uh, thank you uh, to those of you who responded to the paper. So it really did uh, help to shape the proposals that we landed on. I think we very much received broad uh, positive feedback to the discussion paper, essentially supporting the direction of travel. But um, as I'll set out here, there were some uh, some considerations um, that that uh, that were recommended and, and we have uh, looked to take them on board. So, for example, we some of the differences since the discussion paper are do we retain the, the free tier structure? so labels and then uh, two layers of disclosure but we also added other elements to the regime such as the naming and marketing rules um, and clarified rules for, rules for distributors as well. We've also taken a proportionate appro approach to the entity level disclosures um, so just starting on the TCFDs for pillars initially and as I mentioned we'll build more specificity in time. And then, of course, uh, much of the feedback related to the labels themselves. Um, so uh, in listening to the feedback, we simplified the uh, number of labels. We reduced them from five, as you can see on the slide there, to just the three focusing on uh, sustainable outcomes. Um, this was based on strong messages that responsible uh, shouldn't be included, uh, given that ESG integration is largely part of fiduciary duty, and also that uh, not promoted as sustainable could be seen as negative. Um, we also looked at the names of the labels as well, based on feedback both to the DP and uh, the consumer research, that terms like transitioning and aligned were less understood uh, and perhaps too associated with climate. So if we could move to the next slide, please. Um, I just wanted to very briefly cover some of the next steps. So the consultation paper that we published in October is very much just the starting point, And we are going to look to evolve the regime and expand the regime over time. Um, so some of the ways that we intend to do that uh, are around the scope. Intending to start, uh, intended to uh, expand the scope to overseas products and to pensions products, and then also to explore how to, to introduce suitability rules for advisors. And a key aim here will be to confirm that sustainability matters should be taken into account in investment advice and in understanding investors' preferences uh, on sustainability to really ensure that advice uh, is suitable. And obviously, in the meantime, we remind uh, advisors uh, of existing rules uh, to ensure that recommendations are, are suitable. We are also looking to expand our disclosure requirements in time, as I just mentioned, uh, in line with future ISSV standards. Um, so this would be at, at product and entity level. And then we'll look to strengthen our expectations for the disclosure of transition plans, um, which are currently uh, set out as guidance in our TCFD rules in, in line with the outputs of the UK government's transition plan task force, uh, who published their initial outputs for consultation uh, early last month. And then lastly, once the green taxonomy, uh, the UK green taxonomy is developed, we'll also consider how we might incorporate disclosures in to our uh, disclosure requirements. So I think that's everything from me. Um, I will hand back to uh, John or Lee. Thank you. Right, thank you, Louisa. That was an amazing presentation. I think there's a yeah, huge amount of um, detail to digest. And uh, obviously, for those of you that are attending, you'll see that you'll be able to revisit this as a recording as well afterwards, which is amazing. So, you know, obviously keep an eye on the website once uh, we've got that published. Um, but uh, a couple of questions have come in. We'll deal with those towards the end, but we're gonna sort of publish really a, a quick 
polling question and actually sort of um, falls into something that as I was listening to Louisa a minute ago, um, you know, things that I want to find out about as well. But um, for everybody on the call, really, what difference do you feel that the proposed disclosure requirements and investment labels will make going forward? Um, so let's see what uh, you have to say about it as an audience. So um, looking at this, it's definitely going to make some difference, which is amazing. So that's a, a, a good start. Um, so let's see what, uh, generally speaking, everybody is coming up with. Um, lots of you voting. So it's good to see your thoughts. The more of the barrier, actually, because obviously we get a better flavour uh, of how this works. Uh, whilst the, these are coming in, Louisa, very quickly, um, have you found, um, generally speaking, you know, people have absorbed and, you know, feedback wise, are, are they finding this, um, you know, a, a breath of fresh air? Are they finding it that you're moving in the right direction? Thanks, John. Really good question. So, yeah, I think we've had uh, really good, uh, positive initial reactions. Um, yeah, stakeholders very supportive of what we're doing and the need for labels and, and why we're doing this. I think what we are starting to hear now and, and I can see coming through uh, in the, the Q&A here mm -hmm. is just some of those more practical considerations. Mm -hmm. um, so we're really keen to hear about those, you know, want to make it work. So, um, yeah, please do continue to, to feedback on, on any practical challenges that, that you do foresee. Excellent. So if very we publish the results, the, oh, sorry, Louise, I talked right. No, no, I was just saying very much in consultation, listening to <laughs> yeah, really your feedback. So, um, so uh, if we can publish the the uh, the results of that now, you'll see that it's 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 50 50 between um, some difference and a significant difference. Uh, there's a few people, uh, not much different. I'm guessing these are the people that are already on very, very much on top of the uh, uh, of these requirements, but the majority uh, I definitely look, you know, they do feel it's going to make at least some difference and certainly for, for a good, good proportion, a significant difference, um, which is good to see because at the end of the day, a significant difference or some difference will mean that consumers are better served, which, are, you know, at the end of the day, that's what we're all about here. So that's fantastic. So if we can stop sharing that now, I'm going to stop sharing this screen uh, as well, because I'm going to hand over now and Lee's going to drive his own um, slide deck. So Lee, I'll hand over to you now. Actually, while we're waiting, um, there's a, a couple of questions that come in. Actually, Louisa, you might be able to answer one of these. Uh, whilst we're waiting for Lee to uh, re-enter the screen. Uh, this comes from Katie Place, uh, and it's, uh, how did the FCA arrive at a figure of 70% of assets being sustainable in the sustainability focus label? And will there be another level for investments into 70% to 100% sustainable assets? Um, so whilst we're waiting for Lee, would you be able to answer that? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Thank you so much for question um so yes the sustainable focus does as you just say require a threshold of uh or at least proposed uh, to require a threshold of 70 percent uh, of assets invested uh, in a credible standard or uh in uh with regard to a specific sustainability theme um we asked question on this uh on thresholds in the discussion paper and we uh, have engaged and landed at 70% recognising that it might not be at least uh, today possible to, to attain 100% so trying to, to have some level of flexibility while still in terms of the, uh, the assets held in the product but also trying to ensure that the assets are at least predominantly invested sustainability uh, sustainably so that uh, there, there aren't uh, so that aligns with consumers expect when investing in a product called Sustainable Focus. I should also just mention that that uh, works well with another proposal that, well, at least we, we hope it works well with another proposal that, we, uh, that we've set out around unexpected investments. So if a product does hold assets that are that, uh, that a consumer would not expect to see in the product given the sustainability objective of the, the product, then those would need to be disclosed and uh, and that would need to be made clear to consumers. Um, so, uh, yeah, but very much welcome feedback on the threshold. I think so far we have uh, been hearing mixed views on that 70%. So what would be really helpful for us is to have any uh, examples of where you think um, there may be a need for uh, a higher, lower threshold, catering for that 70 to 100%, et cetera. That would be incredibly helpful for us. Thank you. Fantastic. And I can see Lee's back now, so you can yes, have that too. Yes. I was going to say the whole purpose of a dis uh, of a consultation, really, you know, so really encourage you to respond and it, more feedback the better, really, isn't it, Louisa? At this stage, yeah. you know, we really want to hear from anybody uh, who is invested in getting in getting this right. So fantastic. Lee's back. 
Lee, should we try hey. again? Mark, yeah, let's give it a go. Let's go, give it a go. Let's see if it'll screen. Have we got something there? Oh, that's better. We can see now. Perfect. Excellent. I'll let you crack on. Thank you very much for that. Right. So as I was trying to um, highlight, um, uh, Louisa mentioned the figures, but, but it's important to actually understand why these figures are important and why they, why, why they fit in um, to the regulatory process. Um, and I can't remember where I got the numbers from, but I seem to remember um, hearing, reading that around 8% of the money that goes through the advice channel ends up in um, some form of, let's say, uh, doing some good fund. So immediately we have a, a potential problem here. The FCA's figures, their survey indicate 80% of the population would like to do some good, um, and yet about 8% of the money that's flowing through. So that's a 10 times difference in the uh, expected um, requirement from the public and the actual amount that's being invested. Um, and, and people should understand that from a regulatory point of view, there needs to be um, some sort of coming together. Either the 80% is wrong and the 8% needs to come up um, or the 8% um, needs to be driven um, higher uh, by advisors effectively building an ESG and sustainability into the advice process. So that, that's by, by way of background. The, the four regulations I want to quickly run through, um, so I won't be going through every section of them, thankfully, um, MIFID, COBS, um, Consumer Duty and SDR. So under MIFID, and this is very much targeted at advisors, so under PROD 3.3, looking at distributors, i.e. financial advisors, um, the key elements here are the bits highlighted in red. So advisors need to identify the target markets for each financial instrument. They should have been doing that since February 18 when the rules came in. Um, and positive and negative target markets. So for example, a fund that is sustainable, um, you could argue that its positive target market are all those wanting to invest sustainably. And the negative target market are for those clients who say, no, not, on, not in a month of Sundays will you ever put my money near a sustainable product. Um, or ESG product or something. So there's positive and negative target markets there. You've got the target market for the client, target market for the product. Um, advisors also need to look at the nature of each instrument um, and make sure it, uh, it fits to the client's needs. And we're going to come back to needs and preferences and objectives all the way through this. And advisors should periodically review the their own governance and ensure that their advice remains robust and fit for purpose. Um, I've got a specific reference as to where there's all are already big problems in the market in terms of advisors um, doing product governance. That's not the advisor's fault. That's product providers making changes um, and advisors um, not necessarily keeping up to pace be, up to speed because a lot of the changes have not been made public. I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, under COBS 9A, so we have some um, again requirements at the advice side so this is assessing suitability key part of giving advice and so advisors need to ob obtain the necessary information regarding to the client's knowledge and experience in the investment field so it can't be assumed that a client has any knowledge whatsoever um, unless the client's able to demonstrate it and one of the clear areas there where there's a bit of a disconnect is that um, advisors willingly um, as they should ask clients making investments um, for their attitude to risk and capacity for loss. Now that's, it, it, I'm not, I've not heard of a firm that actually says, no, I don't, I don't um, discuss it, don't discuss risk with a client unless the client brings it up, because I assume that um, if it's important to them, they'll bring it up. I mean, that's no way to run an advice business. And yet the same argument uh, is, is turned on its head when it comes to ESG. No. I don't talk about ESG or sustainability. I leave it to the clients to bring it up. Well, on the same basis, you should be leaving, um, should be ignoring attitude to risk as well uh, until the client brings it up. The, 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 there's there's two, two different standards being applied there. And at the end of the day, um, you need to ascertain, advisors need to ascertain what the client's level of knowledge is. And it shouldn't be assumed that clients are 
um, need to be educated on attitude to risk and capacity for loss, but that every single client knows about ESG and sustainability, and if they want it, they'll ask for it. It doesn't make any sense. So uh, advisors also need to understand the investment objectives. I'm going to keep repeating this all the way through, um, uh, uh, including which includes risk tolerance, but not exclusive to, to risk tolerance. Investment objectives can be very wide ranging and only recommend investment services, et cetera, et cetera, which are suitable for the client. I mean, that's, that's the sort of raison d'etre really for, for all, all advice, which is make sure it's suitable for the client. Now, with consumer duty coming in less than a year, um, there are uh, two aspects of consumer duty which directly relate to investment preferences and, and of objectives and going back to the knowledge test. Um, and that's the first one here, number three there. Um, enable and support retail customers to pursue their financial objectives. It's up to advisors to, to ascertain what those financial objectives are. And then the second aspect is, again, number three, um, is consumer understanding. What is the level of the each client's understanding and how do you pitch your conversation with them? So going back to what I said before, you can't make assumptions about a level, a, a client's level of knowledge in one area um, and then not make assumptions about another area. You need to be um, fair and reasonable, treat clients fairly. And that includes making assumptions um, about their level of knowledge on a consistent basis and not selectively. So with consumer duty, those two key um, points come across into the detail now. So under consumer duty, a um, couple of sections here, a firm must enable and support retail customers to pursue, pursue their financial objective. Okay, we've, we've covered that. But then in the paragraph below, there's the reference back to COBS 9A and um, firms um, should know or could reasonably be expected to know that a customer has different financial objectives. That means that not all customers are the same. Okay, and that might be you know, quoting the obvious here, but um, what one client sees as a financial objective might be making money at all costs um, and, th and that's it. And I'll work out what to, how to spend it in the future. Other clients might want to buy a boat, put the kids through university, or invest in line with their religious values. Those are all financial objectives. Make me as much money as possible, but don't breach my religious values. That is a financial objective, and it's a preference. Um, now, this is uh, these are a few highlights um, from Therese Chambers' um, speech recently, um, beginning of last month. Now, I've just picked out a few areas. This is all talking about consumer duty. So there's nothing about ESG and sustainability in here, all about consumer duty. Um, however, we've got references here, as you can see, I put them in bold, consumer understanding, informed investment decisions, clear target market, consumers, meeting consumers' needs, characteristics, and objectives. Those, <laughs> that one statement there means uh, that advisors need to be gathering probably far more information about what clients expect, require, and need, um, and build that questioning into a framework of, I can't assume clients actually know um, enough about the um, certain aspects that I can ignore them. I have to talk about as many options as possible. And then um, focus target market should, should, um, should understand um, the varying needs of clients and the different cohorts of customer. Customers are different, they have different objectives, different needs, and, and again, some mechanism, mechanism needs to be built into the advice process to draw that out, not sitting back and waiting for the client to go, oh, I think you might need to know, as part of your advice, that I require A or B, or I've, I've got knowledge here, and you can build that in. You, you can't make those assumptions. So you need to meet the needs of customers and recognize that not, not all customers have the same needs. So there's a pattern emerging here, which is ask clients what they're investing for and how they want their money invested, which means you need to be educating. And the knowledge issue is a key part of consumer duty. So on the sustainable labels, um, Louise has already um, done a brilliant job of running through, so I, I'm, I'm not going to duplicate here. So we have the, the three core labels. Th these labels will be embedded into every financial advisor's advice process. I would argue that the process uh, needs to be in place now. I would pot potentially 
um, go a little bit further and say actually the process should have been in place when COGS and PROD rules came in uh, under MIFID, um, which takes us back to um, some years ago now in, in the pre-COVID days. Um, so advisors thinking, well, I'll wait for the labels to come in, then I'll do something. Um, that's just a, a potential accident waiting to happen because unless you're talking to clients about the issues now, there's no way you'll be able to just suddenly drop it on them and go, oh yeah, all these funds have been around for ages, but I decided not to tell you until they arrived. Um, that's not a conversation that most advisors really should be having with clients. They should be talking to them now and building up to explaining labels are coming and that's going to be a, a good thing because clients that don't want sustainable focus improvers or impact need to know that these are coming so they can identify the funds that aren't labeled as the ones that are suitable and meet their financial objectives by keeping away from the sustainable stuff. Um, so advisor um, and provider disclosures, from an advisor's perspective, um, I've already said it's, it's going to be a key part of the advice process. You can't ignore it. You're, you're going to be recommending products and funds which have a sustainability statement, client facing material explaining what the fund does. If it's not a labeled product, it can't use, or except on very limited basis, any of the standard um, terminology that will be allowed under a labeled product. So ESG, climate impact, sustainable, responsible. Um, but they still nevertheless have to have a, some sort of um, customer facing statement on sustainability to confirm that they don't take sustainability into account. I mean, how that wording is done um, will, 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 you know, will come out when the, when the labels arrive. Um, but advisors are going to have to pass that information to clients and say, here's a portfolio of funds. And as you'll see, here's links to all the different statements. And you can see all of the funds I've recommended don't take sustainability into account. Um, okay, maybe not worded like that, but that's a sort of a very abridged version of what potentially needs to be discussed. So distributors, um, you know, they're, they're the retail facing and they must provide access to, to this disclosure requirement. That, that's going to be a requirement advice. You can't dodge it. You can't decide not to put that in front of clients. And, and critically, from a compliance point of view, part of my presentation is looking at the compliance side of things, um, your file needs to show how and when you made the clients aware that the documentation existed. And you also must comply with existing prod and consumer duty obligations. So that's make sure clients have it, make sure clients understand what it is you're giving them. There's the knowledge side of things. Um, and make sure you're matching products, services to client requirements. Um, now, um, some key considerations here for advisors. So if we're looking at investment preferences and objectives, that, that phrase there repeatedly comes in consumer duty and reference via consumer duty back into COBS, you must understand clients' investment preferences and objectives. Within that, I've got a, a few little pointers here for you. Um, don't use ESG questionnaires. If your solution to this is I give clients an ESG questionnaire, um, probably not the best thing to do. It's probably better than doing nothing, but in itself, it creates a whole new set of problems. Um, and, and, and that is that if you're giving a client an ESG questionnaire, that's a questionnaire about ESG. I know that's pointing out the, the obvious there. What it's not doing is discussing sustainability or impact or improvers um, or ethical or responsible or, or sustainable development goals. It's simply saying, do you want ESG or not? And, and certainly don't use the, the uh, an ESG or don't use a questionnaire in isolation. In other words, right. Now, I've done all this, ask you all these questions, right, here's another question I need to do. Here we go, this is ESG, now fill it in, please. Um, pointless. All the FCA research that's informed um, the, the SDR is really, um, underpinning that is a lot of behavioral uh, analysis or the way the public understand things. And the public definitely understands issue of sustainability in a broader context. So not, do you want this or not, but in terms of you can invest with traditional, you can invest ESG with risk, you can have the, the labels, we can have ethical and there's philanthropy. So that's the, what's called the full spectrum of capital. That's a broad analysis. And the FCA research has basically said that from the public perspective, looking at things in isolation is, a, is more of a problem. Um, looking at where things fit in as part of a broader whole. Okay, so I can have any of this on this 
full spectrum then yes right well i'm leaning towards that's a, a, that's a better decision making process for clients so first so don't use questionnaires in isolation here we go fill it in they'll want the answer um and try and avoid using esg questionnaires i, I know there's lots of esg questionnaires around um but advisors need to be um very wary um of their, of their use um so don't use questionnaires before the client has an understanding. Again, so don't love a questionnaire of the client and then expect to know them to know what it's about. And beware of retrofitting. I've sort of tangentially referenced this here, here before. So you've made lots of recommendations of funds. Half the funds you've recommended overnight, the companies have retrofitted ESG. Your client file shows, uh, you ask the question, client doesn't want ESG but the funds now have ESG. So this is where you have to make sure they fit, remain fit for purpose. You need to know every single fund that's retrofitted ESG or sustainability um, and make sure that every single advice, every fund recommendation you've ever given is now st still fit for purpose. And you need to be wary of fund ratings. There's no point using fund ratings on subjective issues like sustainability or ESG. Some numbers can be crunched, carbon emissions, that sort of stuff. Number of women on the board, a good G issue and an S issue. Um, but unless you know who made the decision about the rating, why they made it, how they made it, and the subconscious biases that they had in saying, we think this is more important than that. And ultimately, the only person that can put a rating on the fund is the client. It's their money. They're writing the checkout. They're the only ones who's um, view is important about whether fund A is fund, better than fund B. And conversations never happened unless you recorded it. So having a discussion about ESG with a client and then not recording it or, or simply recording, we had a discussion, that never happened. And in the event of a complaint, you can't defend yourself. So what's it all mean for the advice process? Um, we think this, this is what the advice process should look like now. Uh, you fact find, you do your attitude to risk, and then you do your investment preferences and objectives. If you do those things together, you will be able to deliver suitable outcomes. Very simple. If you miss off investment preferences and objectives and a broad discussion in that area, you can't deliver suitable outcomes. Um, so the benefits of a robust compliance process are it needs to be repeatable and it's a repeatable process is better for advisors and administrators. Better management reporting for so under senior management regime. At the FCA at any time when the labels come in or for other issues could say how much business do you write under label X or label Y um, and you'll be able to take that as part of your MI if you're not actually asking the right questions in the right way and you're not writing that business a, a, near, a nil answer probably isn't going to be one the FCA are going to be very happy with because it, it that flies in the face of hang on a minute 80% of clients want this um, so more client engagement, they're more interested in the process. Talking to clients about things that they understand and they relate to is much more interesting than talking about pound cost averaging and alpha beta and asset allocation. Um, and increased referrals and intergen intergenerational client retention. Over 30 years, um, our clients were the best sales department we had on our IFA firm. We never asked for referrals, but we got them constantly because clients talked to their peers about the issues that they were interested in and kept saying, my advisor's talking to me about these things. You should go and talk to my advisor. Um, and professional indemnity. We've spoken to a couple of PI insurers um, who are looking at building in ESG and sustainable questions to their PI renewals next year. So look out for PI renewals landing on your doorstep with lots of questions. How do you do it? What's your process? How much business do you write? What's the biggest case? What's the average case? Um, Lee, can I just interrupt now? Yeah. Sorry, I'm going to say we, we, we're really coming close to the end now. So um, uh, there's so much more that I know you could sort of go on to, but we've got a poll question and a question from the audience as well. Um, it, it, in summary, really, just to sort of, finish off the your presentation is there anything you'd like to sort of um yeah uh, conclude one, with one quick thing which is all the things on there um are our compliance framework everything from website statements terms of business our triage process that's our triage process there's a full spectrum cap every single client with every single advisor can go through that process and there will be a fund at the end of it um a um, couple of points here we won't go through those that is what our new Accord initiative looks like. Absolutely fantastic, isn't it? Nobody will be able to read the screen, but we are delivering our entire compliance framework and advisor support and find a sustainable advisor for the public and find sustainable compliance and find sustainable power planners and education and research from clients and regulatory reviews, including mortgages. Um, and all that will be available free of charge for every advisor in the UK. Done. 
No Fantastic. Problem. Amazing. Thank you. Well done for getting that last bit done, Lee. I really appreciate it. Obviously, if you go to the recording, you'll be able to see those last couple of slides and you better pause the recording and have a good look, look, yep. look at it. Um, so thank you very much for that. So we've got one very quick poll question for you. And then I've got one question from the audience and that should wrap us up quite nicely. So the poll question you can see here is how confident are you that your current ESG fund process and proposition will fully meet the requirements under the new consumer duty? Um, so this would be a very interesting poll here. So there's some, oh, there's some good confidence coming in. I think that's got to be great, isn't it, really? Because, you know, the fact is, um, you know, obviously, I guess really it's adapting current processes to what the, to what the um, ESG proposition is, um, but also linking everything back to consumer duty, Lee, I think is absolutely vital in this, uh, uh, you know, in, in the way that we're going. So I think... Um, I think the confidence is growing as people now adapt more to consumer duty and then anything new that comes along like this, for instance, and investment labels, I think it makes life a lot easier, doesn't that? Yes. Yeah, definitely. Excellent. If we can publish that poll very quickly, you can see confidence is growing in the industry. So 62% of you are saying confident. There's a few not very confident, not sure. Obviously, that's not surprising. It's a lot to take in. Uh, and 6% of you very, very confident. So that's got to be good news again. Um, but as I say, you know, obviously we've got some great contacts here. If you need to speak to people, then please send us some messages. Um, the one final question I've got, um, which was from Andrew Waller. I can see how this fun, this works for funds, but how will this work for discretionary portfolios where there are bespoke direct equities, uh, when there are bespoke direct equities in the portfolio, but the overall requirement of the manager is ESG? Will they need to work within a label too? Um, so I think that one came in through Louise's presentation, but either of you, uh, Lee, are you well placed to answer that I'm, one? I'm unmuted, so um, yep. I'll do a quick one and, and wait to be shot down in flames by Louisa. But my initial reaction to that is that the labels won't apply because um, unless the discretionary service is marketed as a, we will build a totally bespoke portfolio for you, um, and it will be sustainable, um, that potentially, it's not a fund, so, so it's difficult to see what it would a label would attach to. I think you'll find most discretionary fund managers will say, we offer fully bespoke discretionary services in discussion with a client. The client might then say, can you go and buy direct equities that meet my personal values? Because that's not a product being marketed to the public. Um, it's only something that's come out of a discussion with a client. I can't see why a label would apply, but I'm just going to be. I'm we'll quick, quickly defer to Louisa just to check about. <laughs> check, we'll check your answer, Lee, shall we? Yeah. So. <laughs> um, so, pretty much there, but what we're, in terms of the, the rationale and the thinking, but what we're saying is if 90% of that uh, arrangement um, does, uh, in, if, if the underlying products um, and 90% of them do actually use labels, then uh, then the, the overall uh, product would, uh, service would be able to, to, to use a label as well. Um, and then with regards to the naming and marketing rules, 90% uh, of the underlying products could use any label for, for the overall portfolio to be able to still use terms like ESG or sustainable. Um, but yeah, appreciate uh, that it's a kind of high threshold for the, for the reasons that you said. So I think that's a diff that's a difference there between something like an MPS, where you're taking a discretionary service that's buying funds, um, so that can be labelled. Um, but if if they're only buying direct equities, which themselves none of the oh. underlying assets are labelled, then it'll be a discussion between manager and client. It's not a marketed product that's sustainable or impact or improve us. It's a strategy the clients ask the manager to adopt. So direct equities, no. If it includes funds, there's a good reason why an MPS would want to have a label to say to the world, this is what we do. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you both so much. We got there in the end. Um, so we've overrun by a couple of minutes. So thank you for all those that have hung on there. Um, and I've always wanted to do this. The news readers at the end, they sort of shuffle their papers at the end. So I'm just gonna shuffle my papers and say thank you very, very much. Louisa, I, I, fantastic. Thank you so much for presenting today. Lee, uh, a, a marvel as always. So between the two of you, I think we've given huge amount of information to this afternoon. But obviously if there's anything you need to get in touch about, then please do. 
uh, as an audience. So this is uh, myself, John Somerville, Louise Chender and Lee Coates signing off for this afternoon. Hope you've really enjoyed this presentation from the LIBF and uh, welcoming you to the next one, uh, which we'll have coming up in the new year. Have a fabulous Christmas and new year, everybody, if we don't speak to you before. Take care. Thank you.